let's return to This Week in America. Here's your host, Rick Bratton. Welcome back, everybody. Coast to Coast, This Week in America. Idlewai Memories of a Mayo-Trained LDS Medical Missionary is the story of Dr. John S. Jarstad. From humble beginnings as a commercial fisherman to becoming an international expert in eye surgery and an inventor. His book tells the remarkable stories of doctors and patients whose lives were changed by faith, prayers, persistence, and hard work. Dr. Jarstad is a Mayo-trained board-certified ophthalmologist specializing in laser and cataract surgery. His research has been at the forefront of the diagnosis and treatment of eye disease. Dr. John Jarstad, author of Eye to Eye, Memoirs of a Mayo Clinic Trained Eye Surgeon, is our guest on This Week in America. Doctor, welcome to the program. A pleasure to have you with us. Thanks a lot, Rick. I'm happy to be here. What a career that you've done and the lives that you've touched. The people we'll be talking about specifically in the program today and those that are touched that you'll probably never know about that have been beneficiaries of the research and uh, the work that you've done in, in developing your craft. Let's talk about how busy this has to be for you. How does a Mayo-trained eye surgeon maintaining a busy Seattle area practice while serving 55-plus volunteer humanitarian trips around the world including working on the USNS Mercy Hospital ship. How do you juggle all of that? <laughs> that's yeah, a lot. that's the secret. Yeah, yes. That's tough, tough to do, but um, I've really enjoyed those mission trips. It's kind of a nice break for me, and it's almost like a vacation from, you know, the day-to-day -day stuff that we do in, in the clinic and in the surgery uh, in my own practice. So, um, I've, I've formed some really great friendships over the years with doctors overseas, and it's just really fun for me to go over and, and uh, in the beginning, it was training them in the latest techniques. And now they have kind of uh, come up to our level. And so we kind of share um, experience and, and techniques that help help us both. So it's, it's been kind of a great two-way uh, association yes. where, where we can help each other and, and learn the newest uh, and greatest things. Interesting, that, yeah, interesting that evolution of that uh, relationship as, as you've gone through the years. Doctor, tell me a little bit about your background, the scope of your medical expertise, which is very impressive, and some of the mission trips you took, some of the rare conditions, diseases you treated or discovered abroad. It's been a remarkable series of trips for you. Give us a little background on, on your expertise and the impact it's had on these trips. Sure, Rick. Um, I guess I've just happened to be fortunate in, in discovering some things that uh, have really made an impact ar around the world, which I never even imagined I could do that as a commercial fisherman working my way through college. But one of the inventions I came up with was when the president of a, of a lens company came and said, hey, if you were to design uh, the perfect delivery system to put an artificial lens into the eye, what would it be like? And so I said, uh, well, it'd have to be something that's disposable, like a little plastic syringe, but it would have to be tapered at the tip so it could go through a tiny incision. And then the most important thing I said, it should be spring-loaded so that when you push on the plunger, it doesn't suddenly shoot out through the eye and hit the retina. And he says, oh, could you draw that on the whiteboard in the operating room? So I drew it up and he took a photo. And about two months later, he came back with the prototype uh, of a lens uh, injector. And he said, should we call it after you? And I said, oh, that's a little egotistical. So, but um, he said, well, you travel a lot. How about if we call it the passport injector? So that's a great name. And so that was used for a number of years. And then it's been modified by Bosch and Loam. Uh, and, and it's used to insert the crystal lens, which is the only lens that can change focus from far away to close up using the muscles inside the eye. So now it's called the Crystal Cert. They changed the name of it. And uh, I just happened to use one yesterday. That I used. So it's still in use after, after about uh, 20 years. And uh, they've had some modifications and upgrades. But that's one thing. As far as patients go, um, I can think of one really interesting patient. Uh, well, actually, a few. On the, as I was served on the Mercy Hospital ship for the Navy. And uh, I was a civilian consultant volunteer. They asked me to head up the group of volunteers uh, from Utah and different places. And um, there was a patient in Manado, Indonesia, which is right up near the, the border with the Philippines. And this particular young man had only one eye. He was born without his other eye. And he had a condition called Peter's anomaly where the lens and the 
iris, the pupil, are, are uh, adherent to the back surface of the cornea. And I said, well, this really c shouldn't be done on a hospital ship. It's more something we would take on at the university. And so the father uh, insisted. He says, I don't care if he goes blind. He says, this may be the only chance my son will ever have to see. And he was about 17. And, and um, so he, he begged us to do the surgery. And, and so we did. And I didn't know for sure whether he would see much at all the next day when we took the bandage off. So I said, hey, uh, can you see much? And he had a big smile on his face. And then I reached up my hand as high as I could to shake hands with him just to make sure, you know, instead of reaching out. Yes. And he reached up and grabbed my hand. And wow. everybody was just like, you know, thrilled and in tears and everything. And so that was a really remarkable thing. And even more, he got his vision back down to about 2060 where he could pass a driver's test. And then he ended up, he was so grateful for the, for the vision that he ended up going on a, a mission trip himself for his church. So that was pretty, pretty exciting. Uh, one other one was a, a young lady in, the, in uh, Cambodia that um, had a droopy eyelid. And, you know, I don't think much about that, that it's a big disfigurement or anything. But in Cambodia, they were total outcasts in their village because they said that she was possessed by the devil or something. And so she just had this droopy eyelid at age five. And so her mom uh, waited in the heat and 109 degree temperature for two hours so that we would see if we could do her daughter's surgery. And again, we said, well, we're really not set up to do children too much, but she also begged and said, you know, this is our only chance to fix my daughter's eye. So we took her into surgery and um, the surgery went well. We adjusted her eyelid and and it looked normal afterward, just the day after. And she was so grateful and appreciative. And she said, now we can go back into the, into the main part of the village and live a normal life. So there are, there are some really remarkable, miraculous stories of, you know, patients whose family has great faith. And they said, you know, uh, we heard this ship was coming or we heard that a doctor from the U.S. was coming and we've waited. And uh, we're just hoping that we can get things fixed up. And, and it's just been really... Uh, really incredible to be able to witness that and, and to see the faith of people that, you know, uh, trust us so much. Those are amazing stories, and that's plural. This is not something that happened one time, a story that uh, you can't wait to tell people. You're so proud to have been a part of it. But so many stories like this, and you'll find them as you read the book. The book is Eye to Eye. Uh, our guest is the author, John J. Jarstad, M.D., J-A-R-S-T-A-D. His website is drjarstadi2i.com, book available at Amazon, the usual places. What's it like when you do that? This is not helping somebody get over a sinus infection or pneumonia, something like that. This is life-altering, maybe in some sense life-saving. What's it like to be part of that? Yeah, it really is life-changing for the patients. And, um, you know, just the, the amount of, of goodwill that comes back from that and I talk to people, uh, you know, uh, in the military and the government, and they say, "Oh, this is the best kind of diplomacy we could we could really yeah. ask for." Um, and I, I asked, uh, I remember one patient in Africa. Uh, sometimes it's fun to ask the obvious questions. Like I asked him, he was a, he was an older man. He had 12 children in Zimbabwe, and I said, "Why do you want to have cataract surgery?" Because he was blind. He could see the big E, and that was it. And he says, "Oh, because of the animals." I said, oh, yeah, they're just amazing. You can see the giraffes and the zebras and the orangutans and the monkeys, and they're just so playful and everything. He says, uh, I said, is it so you can see those beautiful animals and, and their antics? And he says, no, so they do not eat me. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was something you don't really find too often in the United States. <laughs> no, you come home thinking, okay, at least he's not going to get eaten. So this is a, this is a good part of it. He can see now is is animals are coming after him. Such remarkable yeah. stories in the book Eye to Eye, Memoirs of a Mayo Clinic Trained Eye Surgeon with Dr. John Jarstad, our guest on the program. What inspired you to, to serve? Why did you decide, I have this gift, I have this talent, I'm going to give it back? How did you come to that decision, and what's it been like for you? Yeah, I think um, a lot of it is from uh, the upbringing I had from my parents. My father was the uh, uh, anchorman on the ABC station in Seattle and, and then did sports for a number of years on TV. And, and so he, he also owned a ski and motorcycle shop, a sporting goods shop. And every winter around Christmas time, you would take a load of uh, ski equipment, warm clothes, sleeping bags, everything up to a, 
uh, a boys' ranch for orphan boys uh, up in the mountains. And uh, he had me help him load the truck one time, and I asked him about that. He said, why did we do this, Dad? He said, well, son, when you've done well, you really have an obligation to help other people. And so that was in my mind. And then I found out that about 10% of eye surgeons do volunteer work around the world. And, you know, we don't talk about it usually. And, and uh, you know, it's kind of kept quiet, like the Bible says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing kind of a thing. But um, I got introduced to that at a meeting once at our national meeting. And I saw a doctor from Zimbabwe who uh, asked our group of, of eye surgeons at a dinner, uh, is there anybody who come over to Zimbabwe and teach me the latest eye surgery techniques? And at the time, I was teaching cataract surgery at the University of Washington. And after the meeting, nobody volunteered. So I said, did you find anyone? <laughs> and he said, no. Can you come? <laughs> I said, well, I, I don't even know where Zimbabwe is. He said, it's just north of South Africa. And he said, so when will you come? <laughs> and I said, well, I could probably come in January. That's the slowest time of the year for us. And so he said, uh, oh, and by the way, can you bring some supplies? And I thought, where am I going to find supplies? Or I said, and then another doctor overheard me. He said, oh, co- contact the drug companies. They're really generous about doing that. So the first trip, I took 27 <laughs> uh, duffel bags full of eye equipment wow. over. Wow. And uh, we did surgery for two weeks and just had a wonderful time. And and uh, it made a huge difference. And, and uh, after that, uh, the president of Indonesia asked if we had anyone who could come over and teach them the latest surgery. And so I was able to go there and I've been going to Indonesia about every year since and made some wonderful lifelong friends, both in Africa and Indonesia that uh, we get together whenever there's a national or international meeting and, and share ideas. And it's helped me become a better surgeon. And I think I've helped them in instructing them. And, and they say that, uh, over half of the surgeons in Indonesia have learned their technique from from our work over there. It's just amazing. Remarkable stories in Dr. Jarstad's book, Eye to Eye, the book available. Wherever books are sold, to give you all that information and the doctor's website as we go through the conversation. Doctor, tell me some about maybe some of the astonishing jaw-dropping experiences in other countries, uh, patient background, art, uh, outcome stories. You've touched on some. Give me Give me a couple more because these are remarkable stories. Again, life-altering uh, surgeries that uh, they're just re- remarkable. Yeah, that's, um, I think most recently I went to Honduras and there was a 14-year-old girl who lived up on a side of, up on the top of a cliff and she would walk down the cliff every day to the farm and, you know, on these handholds on rocks and things. And she had cataracts uh, that developed pretty early in life. And so um, she had what's called a white cataract, where the, all they can see is light and dark. And then we did her surgery, and we didn't know if she would have uh, amblyopia or lazy eye from deprivation uh, of vision from an early age. But we took off the patch, and there was a little pet monkey called Buddha Monkey that was there at Projecto Honduras, is the name of the charity. And we built an eye clinic there. But um, we took the patch off, and she said, hey, there's a monkey over there. <laughs> wow. So we knew that she could see. So that was pretty remarkable. And then she could be able to see to walk up and down the, the side of the cliff safely every day. And so we felt good about that. Another real interesting case was when I was in North Korea. And over there, there was a man who could only tell when the sun came up and when it went down. He just could see light and dark. And so um, we ended up taking over one of these crystal lens, the most latest, uh, the latest uh, version of cataract implant. And it just happened to be that was the implant that would fit his eye perfectly. And so uh, we're putting this implant in, and then the next day we take the patch off, and he has almost perfect 20-20 vision where he could only see light and dark. And he was so excited, and he was uh, talking in Korean real fast. And I said, what did he say? What did he say to the interpreter? He said, well, now he can see perfectly. And he was told that he had to remain blind the rest of his life. And so now he doesn't know if he can believe anything his government tells him. <laughs> and so <laughs> one of my patients who, who worked for the CIA said uh, in Seattle when I was there, he said, yeah, that's the best kind of backdoor diplomacy we have. <laughs> so, Just so, uh, uh, amazing. Uh, you feel like you're there with Dr. Jarstad as he's going through these humanitarian trips in his book, Eye to Eye, Memoirs of a Mayo Clinic Trained Eye Surgeon. His website is drjarstadeye2eye.com. J-A-R-S-T-A-D, book available, of course, Amazon, all the usual places. 
Uh, talk about these unique experiences on these humanitarian trips. How has this changed you? What impact has this had on you in your private life and, and the professional life as well? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think one of the things is it's helped me really appreciate the United States of America and all of the benefits that we have living here in this country. Um, our level of medical care is really the highest in the world and has been that way for, you know, for decades. Um, the rest of the world is catching up with us. It's really nice to see that. And I, I feel great satisfaction in training. I've trained about 180 doctors overseas and and they're like your kids, you know, you want them to do well. And it's fun when they call me in the middle of the night and say, hey, I've got this. I'm in the middle of a surgery. What do you think I should do? Let me show you this video. And I'll say, okay, do this, this, and this. And they go, oh, thanks, Dr. Day. That worked. You know, so that's really fun for me. But um, it's also helped me appreciate, you know, the safety that we have here. I know when I went to Nigeria, that's the only place I've been shot at. And my host <laughs> doctor just told me, we're walking the lunch. He says, John, duck. I said, why? <laughs> He pushed my head down and wow. I heard this bullet whizzing past my ear. It makes this characteristic sound like. Shoo, 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 shoo. So um, that was kind of interesting. And then when I got back to England, I actually did lean down and kiss the tarmac thinking, you know, I'm safe Yes, again. yeah, I don't blame you. That's just. So, uh, uh, that's it's been about the most dangerous thing I encountered. A bulletproof vest was probably packed along with medical supplies for uh, subsequent trips <laughs> that, uh, that you were able to, uh, to take there. Right, put you on the spot. I don't know if there's one that sticks out, a memorable or impactful mission trip, uh, or maybe an experience with a with a patient that you've had so far. You've had so many. Is there one trip, one patient that, that really sticks out that when somebody asks you that, that comes to mind immediately? Wow, that's a tough one. I mean, there's, there's so many that, uh, you know, we're – really what I would consider miracles that probably shouldn't have gotten such good vision after our surgery, but did. Um, but I go back to probably the experience of going to North Korea twice and, um, you know, and meeting Kim Jong-un and playing billiards with him and kind of getting to know him a little bit uh, better. And I can see why he and Trump got along well. They're both characters. And, <laughs> and uh, it was fun to, uh, to hear him. He has, speaks really good English. He's very well educated. And uh, I just enjoyed my time with him. And I, I just felt like, uh, gosh, if people could get to know him and if there could be some trust between us, that might break down some barriers in the world. But I, I think one of the other ones, though, that you, you alluded to is um, when Osama bin Laden brought over one of the Mujahideen fighters of his from Afghanistan. And this was when we were allies before he turned and, and uh, was, you know, when we were fighting or they were fighting the Russians. And um, he brought this uh, Mujahideen fighter over, a grizzly, you know, uh, short, little, stocky guy who had cataracts that were so bad he couldn't see. And um, he said, uh, I would like to pay for cataract surgery for this, uh, for this fighter, soldier of mine. And he says, how much will it be? And people that come that far, I give them a price that we have to do $1 more than what Medicare pays. And so I said, this will be it. So he pulls out this envelope with $40, $100 bills fresh hundred dollar bills. He says, will this be enough? I said, yeah, that's, that's plenty. That's fine. So he says, but we need to leave soon. When can we do the surgery? And I said, well, we could do it tomorrow. So we did the surgery the next day and the patient could see and never saw him again. <laughs> and I didn't really understand who this was until I saw him on TV and ophthalmologists are interesting people. We typically have a photographic memory. So can we, we can really remember things that we see because we see images all day long. Yes. And so when he first came on TV later on, I go, that's the guy six foot, about six foot five and about, you know, very thin and wore a, he wore a, a white uh, robe and a turban when he came in. And um, I just knew that's who came over and brought this person over with him. That's just, a, I mean, what, so many amazing stories. You're going to have to read the book to get all of these stories, and you'll feel like you're there on uh, experiencing this right along with Dr. Jarstad. The book is Eye to Eye, Memoirs of a Mayo Clinic Trained Eye Surgeon. Uh, time is going so quickly on the program. Some people would say, why do you do this? With the amazing career that you've had, you could uh, sit back, you could take vacations, you take time off now to go to these impoverished countries and to, to help people. Why do you do this? And why do you continue to do this? Yeah, that's a great question. And that, that kind of goes back to my upbringing in the LDS faith. And um, 
one of the leaders of the church in the early years, uh, Joseph Smith said, a man filled with the love of God is not satisfied with blessing his own people alone, but ranges through the world, um, helping those who are less fortunate. And, and that's kind of what I've sort of adopted. And, and um, I try to live by that. What is it like in just a few minutes left here, but what is it like to take your experiences and you combine those with the scientific discoveries, the creative surgical inventions that you've been part of, a, a key part of, what's it like to share all these experiences with other doctors and with medical students that, that look at you and go, boy, this guy's the pinnacle of, of the profession. I mean, what he's doing is just uh, amazing from a professional standpoint and a humanitarian standpoint. What's, the, what's this like for you? It's the greatest job in the world. I mean, to take somebody that's blind and help them see, and then to teach the young doctors yes. uh, and impart the pearls that I've developed over my years in my career. And, uh, you know, like I said earlier, it's just like your kids. You want them to do well. And it's so great when I see the light bulb go on in their head and they say, I've got it. This is my first operation I've ever done. And you helped me through it. And I'm so grateful. And that's kind of what I live for. What's up next for you? Uh, an excellent job in writing this book. Are you working on another book? Uh, I actually uh, started a romance novel that I uh, had overheard from times when I was in the nurse's lounge and <laughs> overhearing some of the <laughs> Ooh, I like this. I like this. And, and so it's a little steamy, but it's going to be called Women of the Plateau. And it's a, the plateau is the area above Seattle where all the wealthy people live. And so it, it's got some uh, really kind of funny romance stories about nurses and doctors getting together and falling in love and that sort of thing. So I'm kind of almost finished with that book and hopefully it will be one of those Harlequin type romance stories. <laughs> well, I, you know, it's a book on its way to being a motion picture or a television series that has all the elements there. You got my attention like right away and hopefully we'll, we'll have a chance to uh, talk about that book when it's finished. And this has been so much uh, fun having uh, Dr. Jarstad with us on the program to talk about his book, Eye to Eye, Memoirs of a Mayo Clean Trinic Eye, uh, uh, tr Clinic Trained Eye Surgeon. Book available. His website is drjarstadeye2eye.com. Jarstad, J-A-R-S-T-A-D. Uh, the book available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all of the usual places. KingPagesPress.com arranged our conversation today. They're handling uh, as a marketing consultant for the doctor. Doctor, it's been a pleasure having you on the program. Uh, time went by too quickly. So much to talk about in terms of uh, uh, the changing technology, what you've been part of with the amazing discoveries, and the humanitarian work that you've done that's changed lives of, of so many people. Thank you for sharing your story with us on the program. Thanks, Rick. I really appreciate you having me on. It has been our pleasure. And uh, you get that steamy novel finished, give me a call. And we'll, we'll chat about that as well. The book, Eye to Eye, Memoirs of a Mayo Clin a Trained uh, Eye Clinic. The book is available now. It's at Amazon, the doctor's website, drjarstadeye2eye.com. And, of course, information on our website, thisweekinamerica.us. We're back on today's program right after these messages. This Week in America is online. You can visit our website, thisweekinamerica.us. Scott Pinkerton, associate producer of This Week in America. Jay Anderson, segment producer. Ben Watson, webmaster. Otto Bache, director of engineering and TV production. This Week in America produced and is a trademark of Blue Funk Broadcasting, LLC. For information on all of our guests and to listen to this week's show, our website again at thisweekinamerica.us. And I'm Sean Bratton, executive producer of This Week in America.